This is a reading from the Notebooks by Maria Valtorta, 1945 to 1950, February 11th, 1946, to the girls in Narni, and Emma, and Pia, footnote 161, probably a reference to Emma Federici, see note 4. Jesus says, Whoever, after setting his hand to the plow, turns around to look at the past and the possibilities of the past, or looks on both sides and lingers to consider the attractions to be seen there, is not suitable for the kingdom of God. Footnote 162. We shall list the present quote and other which follow in order. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Chapter 7, verses 22 to 27. Chapter 11, verses 7 to 10. Chapter 25, verses 11 and 12. Mark chapter 9, verse 48. Luke chapter 6, 46 to 49. Chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Chapter 9, verse 62. Chapter 13, verses 24 to 27. Chapter 14, verses 28 to 30. And 34 and 35. John, chapter 10, verse 11. Chapter 13, verse 27. Apocalypse, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. And 15 and 16 and 20. And the following is also written. Whoever... Desiring to build a tower does not first calculate the expenses and the difficulties he will encounter to bring it to completion will be mocked on having to leave the work unfinished. And the following is also written, Salt is good, but if it loses its savor, what is it good for? For nothing, and it is thrown out and trampled upon. And I could go on with my words of old to remind you that this is not the way to respond to God's love. I remind you of my splendid praise for the Baptist. What did you go out to see in the desert? A reed shaken by the wind? And it was implied that they had gone to see not a useless, thoughtless reed, but more than a man, more than a prophet, an angel. The angel who, through his resolution in serving the Lord, from birth to death, deserved to prepare the way for the Lord. In truth, in truth you seem to have built your house on sand and not on rock. You have not loved for my sake in me, You did not say yes to me out of love, but out of thoughtlessness and calculation. And the wind of adversity which revives those who are true flames cools you off. Do you want to deserve to hear yourselves being told, I do not know you, when you come into my presence? Do you want the words of the apocalypse to be applied to you? I know your works and that you have the name of being alive, but you are dead. Awaken and strengthen what remains and is about to die. Remember what you have received, being chosen by me, the name which cancels out all ignominy, Bride of Christ. Remember what you have heard, the flame of my love which said to you, Come, and observe it, and do penance. And also, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Oh, in all truth I am at the door of your hearts, and knock, And say, Open to me, O sister, O my bride. But you close the little door, opening onto the rough road over which the lover comes to have you journey along his road and lead you to heaven, whereas you open the big door to the comfortable, attractive ways of the world, on which there are appearances of joy, behind which is the reality of restlessness, afflictions, mockery, and condemnations, the last of which is mine. When I say to you, I do not know you, and I could say so out of charity, for if I lacked charity, I would then have to say to you, out of my sight, you that have betrayed and disdained me. Wake up, act, be holy. I do not like your conduct. You have charity for neither Jesus nor your mother. You crucified her and now confirm her on the cross without mercy not being open with her, forgetful of what you cost her, ungrateful for what she suffers, and will suffer for you. But every saint has his enemies, and the most hostile are always the most beloved among his followers. Well then, at least be sincere, be decisive in your action. I say to you what I said to Judas Iscariot, do quickly what you want to do. I tell you this, and you, you that suffer, I clasp you to my heart. I will not fail you, even if the whole world does. I will not condemn you, O my bride crowned with thorns, even if you have erred as a creature. Your present suffering absolves you from everything. And to be sure, my peace will be the river of rejoicing, which will inebriate you when pain is over. 
and to you as well who are expiating, O Pia, and perhaps tremble at having deserved my reproach, I say, I am the good shepherd. Suffering is expiation, but God gives it to those he loves and wants to be forgiven at the hour of death. Remain in my peace, both of you, in my peace. February 11th, 1946, Our Lady of Lourdes. February 14th, 1946. The doctor came, called to observe the continuous worsening of my condition, the spreading edemas, the basic plural complications, and so many other aspects of my numerous illnesses. While he was examining and speaking, rather, while speaking after the examination, affable and desirous of providing some relief to a sick woman by interesting her in one thing or another, the spiritual voice of Azariah said to me, This is one of your witnesses. A doctor's testimony is very valuable for future verification of a creature of God, and especially for creatures who are spokesmen, as you are. Only the doctor in charge of a case can say whether the individual is ill or has a pseudo-illness, is balanced, or is suffering from simulative psychoses capable of explaining certain phenomena. Remember the value of medical testimony for God's beloved creatures. Remember Fernanda Lorenzoni, Footnote 163, a member of the Third Order of the Lady of Sorrows, 1906 to 1930, mentioned in the notebooks 1944, the entry for March 16th, whose physicians knew and respected God's secrets in her. The man in front of you is, moreover, a good spirit. Do not neglect him, then. Speak, asking for the certificate, going so far as to touch upon your resignation and resistance, which are inexplicable in view of your sick body. Let Father then say the rest, clearly, so as to obtain a useful certificate. The doctor observes professional secrecy, just like the priest. Why so many scruples towards him, then, when the case is already public knowledge, and in inversions which are not always honest and charitable? Human doubts? He himself will remove your doubt very soon. Speak, as I have told you, for the glory of God. I then said, Doctor, now that you have examined me on several occasions and seen me in the different stages and degrees of deterioration, provide the certificate which Father Migliorini wants. Exactly. Explain to me a bit in clear terms what the purpose of it is and what I should say, in what sense, for I am an honest man, and if it's a question of a clinical diagnosis, I want to make it very precise, and for all the organs with radiological exams and so on, but if it's a question of a judgment on the seriousness of the sufferings, I can do so in another way. It's a matter of giving Father a certificate to be attached to the document which will be written concerning me after my death, as priests are accustomed to do in regard to people afflicted by a long infirmity who, in view of the way it evolves and is endured, lead one, leads one to consider the existence of spiritual forces willing the illness and its duration and of spiritual forces existing in a patient because of a spirit of deep religiosity. Father wants to know only if I, from a human standpoint, in the light of my age, could still be alive, if unequivocal suffering is observable in me, if the conditions should be regarded as real or in terms of suggestion, and so forth. Why, in that case I'll do so quite willingly, right at the outset, I'll certainly say that anyone who looks at the case with faith cannot fail to discern supernatural events in it. There should have been no more mention of you for some time if everything had followed a human course. And by just observing the patience and resignation with which you have endured all of this, and for so long, one can grasp that there is a living, heavenly fount in her. One either believes or does not. But if one believes, and I do, why deny the supernatural? Some days ago, I also prepared two certificates attesting to a miracle worked through the foundress of the sisters at the hospital. The nun in the ward asked me for them, and I very gladly prepared them. The healing, in all honesty, could not be said to have come through the agency of medicine. The sister said she had placed the image of the foundress under the bed of the patient when he was already dying, and the healing had taken place. Why refuse recognition of the merits of the sister who had died in the odor of sanctity? I would like to get matters straight, though, so as to orient myself properly. I did not specify the matters, 
because doing so is irksome for me, and Azariah had not told me to. But I suppose that the doctor, with such good relations with the sisters at the hospital, is not entirely in the dark about the dictations and so on, even if he has only a vague impression. I thus feel it is useful for you to set forth the circumstances clearly for the doctor. Among other things, this was the second time he caught me by surprise as I wrote, and I appear to be rebelling against his advice that I not write. Nor can I say to him, I disobey you because I obey God as a spokesman. Don't you agree? There is nothing dishonorable to be said to the doctor on my case, and if the bishop did not hesitate to send Dora, footnote 164, as affirmed in regard to another doctor, see the entry for November 29th in the notebooks of 1944. And if the bishop did not hesitate to send Dora to the doctors to discredit her, I think it is justifiable to be explicit with my personal physician to add a scientific note by a believer, though, as support for the statements, all of them in spiritual and emotional terms, provided by my other witnesses on my case. Don't wait for me to be dead to do so. Don't always wait. Footnote 165. Oh, I'm sorry, I read footnote 165 in place of 164. So footnote 164 says, see note 121, and now footnote 165 says, as affirmed in regard to another doctor, see the entry for November 29th in the notebooks 1944. Uh, don't always wait. Time and events are rapid and, in and changeable. Afterwards, it is useless to be sorry and bewail it. February 15th, 1946. In the face of my intimate reflection on why the Lord was now spurring rather than merely allowing me to receive people and not conceal who I am, and this aspect frightens me because I fear diabolical deceit, he responded to me as follows, Obey and do not be afraid. You will not suffer greater harm therefrom than has been done to you so far, even while remaining hidden. And at least the harm done by those unable to understand God where he is present will be neutralized by what upright, spirit, what upright spirits observe and say. Let us use the world's cunning to combat the world, the cunning taught by the world's master. I said, be as simple as doves and as cunning as serpents. Footnote 166, Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Satan turns his pupils into serpents, and they adopt clamorous postures appropriate for seducing the leaden hearts of worldly men, whereas upright spirits shun these exhibitions because the soul senses they are insincere. They don't know where to go find what they feel they need simply because in 90% of the cases the true voices remain secret and secluded. Enough. That's enough for you. May at least the uncertain be able to compare and choose. And each will choose according to his merits for the real seekers of God will go in one direction and the impure seekers of God in another. Those who hope for human delight or profit from friendship with a voice or instrument are impure seekers. I abhor them, for I do not raise up my voice and my instruments for these reasons. I am not a mountebank, but my voices are not, either. I am not a charlatan or an impersonator, but they aren't either. I am not entertainment, but they aren't either, and they should be respected. But when there is an attempt to undermine them with human arts and diabolical arts, distort them and denigrate them as sick, not to mention calling them madmen and liars, then I say, enough, silence and concealment, come out and become known to the best. And this is not inconstancy in my conduct, but lofty, far-sighted justice, and also awareness and knowledge of time. The river mouth is drawing near. Let the river nourished by me be known before it is lost in the supernatural sea. M my peace be with you, martyred John, but you know, little John, the big John saw the heavenly Jerusalem and the glories of the Lamb and the mysteries of the last times after martyrdom. Footnote 167, Revelation, chapters 21 and 22. Martyrdom makes the veil of the flesh thinner. It is God's saliva upon still human senses. Afterwards, vision gets clearer and clearer, for it must prepare for the possession of God. And so it shall be. And if there are some who do not believe and cannot believe, the deniers, the blasphemers, and the overbearing, 
who would like to set limits upon God by denying him the power to make a non-entity his instrument, the power to work miracles, their incredulity is the heap from which the stones are taken for lapidation. Goodbye, little John of the martyrs. May God's blessing be your viaticum, hour by hour, torment by torment. February 17th, 1946 In the deep of the night, as I was thinking, Jesus said to me, You transcribed your prayers of love as I told you to. Footnote 168 on February the 10th Your steps along the way of the cross, they are more valuable than the visions and the dictations. The latter are a school, and you are a pupil. They are an examination result on what you are. And you know people cannot call themselves educated unless they show proof that they are. As long as they remain at their desks and listen distractedly, without will, can they say that they are educated? No, they cannot. But when at the end of school they give proof of what is in them and speak about the wisdom they possess instead of listening to the teacher, one can then say, this is what the student thinks, and they are approved with a certificate which opens the doors for them to get employment and income. And for you, the gates to heavenly gain, the possession of God, shall be opened, not because you are a spokesman, but because you are a voluntary victim, because with the word of the Spirit, with the word of love, you have written those words to crystallize on paper what your spirit was already doing. This alone will be of value to judge you on the earth and in heaven, and this alone will explain why I have made you a spokesman, because you showed good will and strong love. Be at peace with my blessing. February the 20th, 1946. It was 12.15 a.m., and I would have liked to be still and rest, but Azariah, my angel, appeared. I had to take the first piece of paper I could find and write as best as I could, promising myself I would copy it into the notebook in the morning, and that is what I am now doing. Azariah said, Tell Father this. Let him tell Dora not to repeat, ever again, or for any reason, a subterfuge like the one she recently resorted to. She should let poor unfortunates do such things and be sincere if she wants to receive the truth. Our most holy Lord Jesus was offended to the utmost by this malice and this disobedience to the bishop, the head of the diocese. If Dora knows that, by her own spontaneous will, she is not doing anything wrong, why is she afraid of clarification? The bishop was within his rights in making sure and she was obliged to obey. Why not obey in simplicity without seeking adornments and embellishments to conceal what is essential, using deceit? There was no need to say a lot. Let me be visited because I need this would have been enough, and she would have received a better clarification, a better certification in both human and supernatural terms, and above all would not have offended the Lord with deceit and malice. This is not right. The intellect should be used and made to work for justice, not evil. The disturbance to which she has been subjected in recent days derives from her error. Satan benefits from it and laughs, and the truth draws away, unable to coexist where there is the stench of deceit. Those called to special friendships must be clean mirrors, without the slightest voluntary mist. Let Father make this known, and he should not go, but send someone. There is nothing else. Let us, let us together say, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, and then rest in peace. Nine a.m. The Archangel Raphael and Tobit, footnote one sixty nine, Tobit, chapter six. The Archangel Raphael appeared to me, uh, appeared alone to me in his sweet beauty, at the moment of communion, and I was at once overtaken by the serene joy which the good companion communicates. He remained present until two thirty p.m. with no gesture other than a continuous smile and an approving nod of his head as if he wished to tell me silently that I was that something I was doing was fine. I did not know what, since I was writing, I did not know what, since I was writing an ordinary family letter to the Belfantes. In short, after my final request, but tell me what you want, since you are looking at me, smiling, and remaining silent, he began to speak. You have obeyed promptly and acted well, always like that. You have helped me. 
and I have asked my Lord if I can take you with me to have you repeat Tobit's journey, at least in the points I am fondest of. You so love to see, and you so love what is beautiful. The banks of the Tigris cutting through the Assyrian countryside were very beautiful. Come with me. And I went with him. Oh, it wasn't frightening. I placed my feverish hand in his strong, fresh hand, and went from time to time looking at the good companion, who was smiling so sweetly while showing me the beauties of nature surrounding us. A green plain, very fertile, spread out around as far as the eye could see. The season was good. Springtime, I would say from the state of the crops, unless they sold twice here, there was the wide river, oh, much wider than the Jordan, and with much more abundant waters, which proceeded solemnly towards the far-off sea. A very lovely country, giving rest to the eyes and peace to one's heart. Raphael looked at me and smiled, saying, Look, look carefully, not at me, but at everything. Here I am, Azariah the companion. I looked with difficulty, taking my eyes off the radiant face of the archangel, and I became a spectator. There was the archangel with the appearance of an ordinary man, going along, speaking with Tobit, who was listening to him with deference, obedient to all of his indications. Azariah recommended that they rest, and Tobit obeyed without replying. Azariah advised the young man to bathe in the river to get some refreshment, and Tobit obeyed solicitously. And while he was in the river, the calm waters got stirred up, and a fish as big as a young man popped out, trying to reach Tobit's naked body and bite it, and perhaps take it with him to the bottom and devour it. He looked like an enormous loose, a big salmon or sturgeon with a big mouth furnished with three rows of teeth like needle points, a black back and a white belly shining under the veil of waters created as he darts. Tobit saw him so close by, set between him and the bank to shut off the way for the young man, and howled, seized by terror. Oh, my Lord, a monster is attacking me! Azariah, sitting on the grassy bank, leapt up and shouted, Don't be afraid! Grab him by the gills, keeping behind him, and pull him towards you! That's it! Now he's turned around! Indeed, the beast, on hearing another voice and the rustling of the willows displaced by Azariah, who, taking off his shoes and socks, went down into the river, ready to come to the aid of his companion, turned round, rotating his round, cold, impenetrable, cruel fish eyes, and Tobit gripped him by the gills and pulled him, withstanding the blows from the tail and the jerking with which the fish tried to get free. Tobit, wa Tobit walked backwards, pulling and pulling, digging his feet into the pebbly shore of the river, which got lower and lower, already disclosing the first aquatic grasses and turning into slippery mire. How tarring was the last stretch of the way! The fish made a superhuman effort to get free, to save himself. The young man made a superhuman effort to hold on to him. Tobit was about to exhaust his strength. His hand slipped wearily over the left gill, and his foot slipped in the slime. The fish grasped the weariness of his capturer and launched such a desperate blow of his tail that Tobit lost his balance and fell, still trying to grip the fish. The latter, though nearly on dry land, tried to work prodigies to complete his victory, but Azariah caught him by the forked tail, immobilizing him until Tobit got up, seized him again, and dragged him, now sure of himself, onto the sand, no longer miry, where one's foot can dig in and withstand. The fish gasped for air, quivered, and died. Take the knife and gut him. Remove the heart, liver, and gall, and keep them in that little leather bag. We'll always find drinking water without taking it with us. The heart, liver, and gall are useful, wonderful medicines. I'll tell you how to use them. And now let's cook the fish. It will be a viaticum for us, to, for, our, for us on our own. A fire of twigs roasted the substance of the fish, cut into thick slices, which the two consumed with a good appetite. Afterwards, placing the leftovers in their knapsacks, separating the slices with large leaves sprinkled with salt, and then they resumed their journey in great friendship, and Azariah taught and explained many things, including, when asked by Tobit about what the fishes and trails were good for, the explanation found in the Bible. Footnote 170, Tobit chapter 6, verses 7 to 9. Really? Tobit asked in astonishment. Oh, if only it were true 
to restore my father's lost sight. That's the way it is. But first you could receive other gifts of wealth and love. Azariah prodded to test his companion's spirit. Oh no, oh no, I am, I'm in a hurry about my father. I am always fine. Let us do what we have to in a rush. For if before I felt an urge to go back, now it's even stronger. Since what's awaiting me is not only the joy of my father's embrace, but the joy of giving light back to his darkened eyes. You believe my word. And if what I'm saying weren't true, young man, Azariah tempted him. Oh no, your face is transparent and serene. You speak of God with such peace. Only a saint can be the way you are, and saints do not lie. I have faith in you. Azariah smiled luminously. Where shall we lodge? asked Azariah. And the archangel spoke to him of Sarah of Ragel, just as the Bible, <coughs> footnote 170, uh, 171, Tobit chapter 6, verses 10 to 18, relates, with the counsels to wed and free her without fear from every demon. And I saw the entrance to Ragel's house and the recognition and the wedding of the virgin widow with the good Tobit. And the night was so very sweet, or rather the nuptial nights, after the demon had been overcome and relegated to another place, when the virgin spouses united themselves to God in prayer, therefore before becoming a single flesh. And with this sweetness the vision faded out, and I again found myself with Raphael, who said, Tobit received more than he had desired, because he was obedient and faithful, but I am the one who heal and teach people to, he to heal from satanic treachery. For this reason I was designated to look after that soul who is unspeakably tormented by a demon who hates her and who needs a great deal of help to be freed from the enemy persecuting her. But it is very painful not to find perfect submission in her like young Tobit's. He overcame because he was docile and obedient, grateful to God, whose goodness he celebrated with a sincere, humble spirit. For it is a good thing to keep the king's secret hidden and not to get puffed up about it, but to publish the works of God, not with words, but with increasingly manifest holiness, not contaminated by human wretchedness, is a very good thing. Temptation is a trial, not damnation, if one is able to resist it. Afterwards, people are pleasing to the Lord, but it is necessary to be vigilant and persevere until the final hour, and with keen wariness in all things. As for you, do not be afraid, for if I have been with you, if I now am, it is because God sends me to bring you the light and the peace of the heavens. I shall not go back to where my Lord sends me, and may the peace I wish you always be with you. And from the point indicated with triangles to the point indicated with a dot, I had to abbreviate because there was a visit from the lawyer. So let me show you. There's the uh, triangle. And there's a dot, and then there's another triangle. Sorry, so this is the part that was abbreviated from here to there because of a visit. I had to abbreviate because there was a visit from the lawyer, and I was caught between two fires and could not understand the man or literally recall what the archangel was saying to illustrate the operations of obedience and prayer in overcoming Satan, present in infirmity, traps, and misfortunes to disturb and bring people to despair, and also present in the circumstances of extraordinary graces, with the intention of triggering acts of pride and self-complacency, which would disturb their hearts, separating them from God. I remember all of this, but I would say it with my own words, for I keep the fruit and let the rest go. I remember the sentence, if you had been satisfied with yourself, I would have abandoned you. Because you were humble, I protected you until the end. The other words have disappeared, and I suffer so when this happens to me. In addition, I distinctly remember what that the archangel told me at the beginning of his closing statement. This vision is for you, entirely for you. It should not be communicated to Dora. Footnote 172. See note 121. Because this is the will of the Lord. She must be unaware of what you see. If she so deserves, she, she shall see. But she must not have cross-stitch canvases with designs so as to weave over them with her own thread, to each his own. 
As regards me, she will never receive anything, and, God willing, may there never be anyone who provides it, more or less knowingly contravening God's prudence and order. Footnote 173. We pass over 96 handwritten pages written between February 21st and March 12th, 1946, containing 10 episodes from the third year of the public life.